This is a reading from The Sinner's Guide by Luis de Granada. Book 5, Duties and Virtues. Chapter 40, The Three Kinds of Virtues and Man's Duty to Himself. Having spoken at length of the sins that profane and degrade the soul, let us now turn to the virtues that elevate and adorn it with the spiritual treasures of justice. Our threefold obligation to virtue. It belongs to justice to render to everyone his due, to God, to our neighbor, and to ourselves. If we faithfully acquit ourselves of these duties to God, to our neighbor, and to ourselves, we fulfill the obligations of justice and thus become truly virtuous. To accomplish this great work, let your heart be that of a son toward God, that of a brother toward your neighbor, and that of a judge toward yourself. In this, the prophet tells us, the virtue of man consists. I will show you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Verily, to do judgment, to love mercy, and to walk solicitous with your God. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. The duty of judgment is what man owes to himself the duty of mercy, what he owes to his neighbor, and to walk carefully before God is the duty he owes to his creator. The Reformation of the Body <clears throat> Charity, it is truly said, begins at home. Let us therefore begin with the first obligation mentioned by the prophet, the duty of judgment that man must exercise towards himself. Every just judge must enforce order and discipline in the district over which he exercises jurisdiction. Now the kingdom over which man rules is divided into two distinct parts, the body with all its organs and senses and the soul with all its affections and powers. Over all these he must establish the empire of virtue, if he would faithfully perform his duty to himself. To reform the body and bring it under the dominion of virtue, the first thing to be acquired is a modest and decorous bearing. Let there be nothing in your carriage, your deportment, or your dress, says St. Augustine, capable of scandalizing your neighbor. But let everything about you be conformable to the purity and sanctity of your profession. Hence, a servant of God should bear himself with gravity, humility, and sweetness, so that all who approach him may profit by his example and be edified by his virtues. The great apostle would have us, like fragrant plants, giving forth the sweet perfume of piety and filling all about us with the order of Jesus Christ. See, Second Corinthians chapter two verse two, uh, chapter two verse fifteen. Such indeed would be the effect of the words, the actions, and the bearings, and bearing of those who serve God, so that none who can draw near them can resist the sweet attraction of sanctity. This is one of the principal fruits of a modest and recollected deportment. It is a mute but eloquent teaching which draws men to the love of virtue and the service of God. Thus do we fulfill the precept of our Savior. So let your light shine before men, that, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. The prophet Isaiah also tells us that God's servants should be plants bearing fruits of righteousness and virtue, the beauty of which will, be, will lead men to extol the power of their Creator. Isaiah 61, verse 3. This does not mean that our good works must be done to gain the applause of men. For as St. Gregory tells us, a good work may be public only while its intention remains a secret between God and the soul. The example we thus afford our brethren destroys neither the merit of humility nor the desire to please only God. This is from uh, Gregory the Great, Moralia in Job, Moral Addresses on the Book of Job. Another fruit that we derive from this exterior modesty is a greater facility in preserving the recollection, devotion, and purity of the soul. The interior and exterior man are so closely united that good or evil in one is quickly communicated to the other. If order reigns in the soul, its effect is experienced in the body, and the body, if disturbed, renders the soul likewise restless. Each may, in all, re in all respects, be considered a mirror of the other, for the actions of one are faithfully represented in the other. For this reason, a composed and modest bearing must contribute to interior recollection and modesty, while a restless exterior must be incompatible with peace of soul. Hence, the wise man tells us, he who is hasty with his feet shall stumble. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 2. Thus would he teach us that he whose exterior is wanting in that calm gravity that is the distinctive mark of God's servants must inevitably stumble and frequently fall. A third effect of the virtue we are considering is to communicate to man a composed and gravity 
a composure and gravity befitting any office he may fill. We hold an example of this in Job, who tells us that the light, the dignity of his countenance, ne never fell to the earth. See Job chapter 29, verse 24. And speaking of the authority of his bearing, he says, The young men saw me and hid themselves, and the old men rose up and stood. The princes ceased to speak and laid finger on their mouth. The rulers held their peace, and their tongue cleaved to their throat. Job chapter 29, verse 8 to 10. But the gravity and dignity of this holy man were mingled with so much sweetness and mercy, that as he tells us, when seated as a king with his army about him, he was a comforter to those who mourned. See chapter 25 of Job. Wise men condemn this want of modest gravity, less as a fault in itself, than as a mark of levity. For, as we have already observed, an unreserved and frivolous exterior indicates an uncontrolled and ill-regulated interior. Hence the author of the Wisdom of Sirach says, The attire of the body and the laughter of the teeth and the gait of the man show what he is. Sirach, chapter 19, verse 27. As the faces of those who look therein shine in the water, says Solomon, so the hearts of men are laid open to the wise by their exterior acts. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. Such are the benefits that result from a grave and modest deportment. We cannot but deplore the conduct of those who, through human respect, laugh and jest with a freedom unbecoming their profession, and allow themselves indulgences that deprive them of many of the fruits of virtue. A religious, says St. John Climacus, should not abandon his fasts through fear of falling into the sin of vainglory. Neither should the fear of the world's displeasure cause us to lose the advantage of gravity and modesty in our conduct, for it is as unreasonable to sacrifice a virtue through fear of offending men as it would be to seek to overcome one vice by another. The preceding remarks apply to our manners in general. We shall next treat of the modesty and sobriety that we should observe at the table. Temperance <clears throat> The first thing to be done for the reformation of the body is to put a rigorous curb on the appetites and to refrain from immoderate indulgence of any of the senses, as myrrh, which is an exceedingly bitter substance, preserves the body from corruption after death, so mortification preserves it during life from the corruption of vice. For this reason we shall consider the efficacy of sobriety or temperance, a virtue upon which all the others depend but which is very difficult to attain because of the resistance of our corrupt nature. Read then the words in which the Holy Spirit deigns to instruct us in this respect. Use as a frugal man the things that are set before you, lest, if you eat much, you be hated. Leave off first for manners' sake, and exceed not lest you offend. And if you sit among many, reach not your hand out first of all, and be not the first to ask for drink. Sirach, chapter 31, verses 19 to 21. Here are rules worthy of the Sovereign Master, who wills that we should imitate in our actions the decorum and order that reign in all his works. St. Bernard teaches us the same lesson in these words. In regard to eating, there are four things to be regulated, the time, the manner, the quantity, and the quality. The time should be limited to the usual hours of our repast. The manner should be free from that eagerness that makes us appear absorbed in what is set before us. The quantity and quality should not exceed what is granted others, except when a condition of health manifestly requires delicacies. This is from Bernard of Clairvaux. Literarum ad fratres de Monte Dei, Letters to the Brothers of the Mountain. In forcible words, supported by appropriate examples, St. Gregory declares the same sentiments. It belongs to abstinence not to anticipate the ordinary time of meals as Jonathan did when he ate the honeycomb, not to desire the great delicacies as the Israelites did in the desert when they longed for the flesh pots of Egypt, not to wish for the choicest preparation of food as the people of Sodom, and not to yield to greediness as Esau did when he sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. Hugh of St. Victor tells us we must be very attentive to our deportment at the table, always observing a certain modesty of the eyes and a reserve of speech. There are some, he says, who are no sooner seated at table than their uncontrolled appetite is manifested by their bearing. Their eyes eagerly scan the whole board. 
they rudely help themselves before others and seize upon the nearest dish, regardless of all, of all save self. They approach the table as a general approaches a fort that he is to assail, as if they were considering how they can most quickly consume all that lies before them. Control these disgraceful indications of a degrading vice, and overcome the vice itself by restricting the quantity and quality of your food. Bear these wise counsels in mind at all time, but particularly when the appetite is stimulated by hunger, or by rare and sumptuous viands that prove incentives to gluttony. Beware of the illusions of this vice, which St. John Climacus tells us is most deceptive. At the beginning of a repast, it is so clamorous that it would seem that no amount could satisfy our hunger. But if we are firm in resisting its unruly demands, we shall see that a moderate portion is sufficient for nature. An excellent remedy against gluttony is to bear in mind when we go to the table that there are, as a pagan philosopher says, two guests to be provided for the body, to which we must furnish the food that its necessity craves, and our soul, which we must maintain by the virtues of self-denial and temperance. A no less efficacious remedy is to compare the happy fruits of abstinence with the gross pleasures of gluttony, which will enable us to appreciate the folly of sacrificing such lasting advantages for such pernicious and fleeting gratifications. Remember, moreover, that of all the pleasures of the senses, those of taste and feeling are the lowest. We have them in common with all animals, even the most imperfect, while there are many that lack the other three, seeing, hearing, and smelling. These former senses, tasting and feeling, are not only the basest, but their pleasures are the least enduring, for they vanish with the object that produced them. Add to these considerations the thought of the sufferings of the martyrs and the fasts and mortifications of the saints. Think, too, of your many sins that must be expiated, of the pains of purgatory, of the torments of hell. Each of these things will tell you how necessary it is to take up the cross, to overcome your appetites, and to do penance for the sinful gratifications of the past. Remember, then, the duty of self-denial. Prepare for your necessary meals with such reflections before your mind, and you will see how easy it is how easy it will be to observe the rules of moderation and sobriety. Through this great prudence, though this great prudence is necessary in eating, how much more is required in drinking? There is nothing more injurious to chastity than the excessive use of wine, in which, as the apostle says, there is luxury. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It is at all times the capital enemy of this angelic virtue, but it is particularly in youth that such indulgence is most fatal. Hence, St. Jerome says that wine and youth are two incentives to impurity. Wine is to youth what fuel is to fire. As oil poured upon the flames only increases their intensity, so wine, like a violent conflagration, heats the blood, enkindling and exciting the passions to which the highest pitch of folly to the highest pitch of folly and madness. Witness the excesses into which man is led by hatred, love, revenge, and other passions when stimulated by intoxicating liquors. The natural effect of this fatal, in, fatal indulgence is to counteract all the results of the moral virtues. These subdue and control the baser passions, but wine excites and urges them to the wildest licentiousness. Judge, therefore, with what vigilance you should guard against the attacks of such an enemy. Remember, too, that by wine is meant every kind of drink capable of robbing man of the use of his reason or his senses. A philosopher has wisely said that the vine bears three kinds of grapes, one for necessity, one for pleasure, and one for folly. In other words, the wine taken with moderation supports our weakness. Beyond this limit, it only flat, flatters the senses, <clears throat> and drunk to excess, it produces a species of madness. Heed no inspiration or thought that you have reason to think is excited by wine, the worst of evil counsellors. Avoid with equal care all disputes or arguments at table, for they are often the beginning of grave quarrels. Be no less moderate in speech than in the indulgence of your appetite, for, as Holy Scripture tells us, there is no secret where drunkenness reigns. Proverbs 31, verse 4. We shall find rather unbridled tongues, immoderate laughter, vulgar jokes, violent disputes, the revelation of secrets, and many other unhappy consequences of intemperance. 
An another evil against which I would warn you is dwelling upon the merits of certain dishes and condemning others because they are not so delicate. How unworthy it is of man to fix his mind and heart on eating and drinking with such eagerness that the burden of his conversation is on the excellent fish of such a river, the luscious fruit of such a country, and the fine wines of such a region. This is a clear proof that he has lost sight of the true end of eating, which is to support nature, and that instead of devoting to this work the senses destined for it, he debases his heart and his intelligence to make them also slaves of his gluttony. Avoid with all especial care attacks upon your neighbor's character. The malicious rapacity that prompts us to tear our neighbor's reputation in pieces was justly condemned by St. John Chrysostom as a species of cannibalism. Will you not be satisfied with eating the flesh of animals? Must you devour human flesh by robbing another of his good name? St. Augustine had so great a horror for this vice, from which so few tables are free, that he inscribed on the walls of his dining room the following lines. This board allows no vile detractor place, whose tongue will charge the absent with disgrace. Still another point to which I dis wish to direct your attention is the warning given by St. Jerome that it is better to eat moderately every day than to fast for several days and then to eat to excess. A gentle rain, he says, in proper season benefits the earth, but violent floods only devastate it. Finally, let necessity, not pleasure, govern you in eating and drinking. I do not say that you must allow your body to want for nourishment. Oh no, like any animal destined for the service of man, your body must be supported. All that is required is to control it, and never eat, and never to eat solely for pleasure. We must conquer, not destroy, the flesh, says St. Bernard. We must keep it in subjection, so that it may not grow proud, for it belongs to it to obey not to govern. This is from Bernard of Clairvaux, Literarum ad fratres de Monte Dei, Letters to the Brothers of the Mountain. This will suffice to show the importance of this virtue, but he who would learn more of the happy fruits of temperance and its salutary effects, not only upon the soul, but even upon health, life, honor, and happiness, may read a special treatise on this subject that we have added to our book on meditation and prayer.